This is Dan McLaughlin, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Yeah, this is fun. So we got a couple things to talk about. For those who don't know, Dan's been on a few times. He writes at the National Review, but he also has had a blog since the early days of blogging, and uh, he talks about baseball. So I thought, Dan, we might talk, and you've got a Brooklyn Dodgers hat on. I didn't wear my Dodgers hat today, but I thought we might start with baseball and then see what kind of political stuff we can get. Everybody should check out the National Review. Go to Dan McLaughlin's page, and you'll always see some really good insight. And, and I would say that uh, you're looking for a best way forward, not a, a uh, partisan way forward, and I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we uh, we we stand for something, and and we write from that perspective. But I do think it's important to try to, you know, try to be fair in in how you present things. So, you know, I, I probably am strongest for the Dodgers, but I love baseball in general. But we had a, you know, Brooklyn. I'm sorry, Brooklyn. Uh, Colorado is a weird stadium. Weird things happen. They, you know, the fountain turns <laughs> off the, of the game. A cat runs across the field. A home run goes over the fence and gets pulled back in and turns into a single, you know, and an out <laughs> instead of a home run. And then an inside the ballpark home run to left field. And again, where the ball is kind of brought back. It just it was an insane weekend. Do you like the uh, the fact that in baseball, something absolutely unique, despite millions and millions of outcomes, absolutely unique can happen in a given game or what draws you to the game all these years later? Oh yeah, I mean that's that's absolutely a big part of the appeal is that sense that that you're always you know you're always going to see every year something you've never seen before. Um, think of the uh, uh, what I guess we were commemorating the the I think twentieth anniversary now of uh, Randy Johnson vaporizing a a bird with a pitch, uh, you know, which was just one of those once in a million kind of physics moments of the bird had it just had to be perfectly timed. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, uh, you know, every year we're going to, I mean, last year, of course, it was a particularly weird year. Um, I think hopefully we're going to be back towards an increasingly normal year this year. Um, but we're not there yet. Uh, you know, I mean, as a Mets fan, I'm, I'm sort of frustrated that the opening weekend didn't include any Mets baseball because the Nationals had some positive tests. Um, so, uh, you know, it, 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 it's one foot in front of the other, but, uh, but there, there will always be, there will always be some, uh, something new, something different. And I think there's going to be some unexpected stuff this year, you know, um, uh, one of the reasons for that actually is that there was no minor league baseball last year. Um, and so I think you're going to have a certain number of prospects coming up where people really don't know what to make of these guys because they didn't put anything in the books last year. Uh, and some of them, uh, you know, some of them may be rusty, of course, but, but others may have sort of developed their skills a little and nobody really saw it happen. Um, you know, one of the guys who busted out over the opening weekend uh, is uh, your Mer uh, Mercedes, uh, you know, went eight for his first nine, uh, five hit game in his uh, opening appearance. He's 28 years old and the guy's been, you know, he's sort of kicked around uh, to, you know, foreign leagues and, and the minors. Um, but, you know, nobody really, I don't think he was on a ton of people's radar going into the season because you just didn't have you know, a recent high level competition of this guy. Right. Right. The, the other thing too, with the, the minor leagues, also the pitching, because there was such a short season, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that rhythm is gone because, you know, most of the season was spent, you know, locked up and, and protected from a uh, COVID virus. And so that there's a lot of unknowns injury wise and what can pitchers handle? You know, you don't want to break up. I mean, look, when you've got, players that are making a quarter million dollars you know over the life of a contract the last thing you want to do is explode their arm trying to to win the uh win the league you know win the division in may you know and and it's going to be interesting to see how teams approach this challenge what, what are your thoughts like how did is it is it overplayed the whole um you know we only played 60 games last year what are we going to do about these pitchers or, or are these guys capable of throwing 150 innings or whatever that number is going to be, you know, believers. I think they got there was sixty innings. What, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think there's any reason why a guy only, you know, I mean, it seems to me that if you have a healthy pitcher in his prime and he only threw like seventy innings last year, that you ought to see that as a guy who, yeah, okay, maybe maybe you're going to be further into April before you feel stretched out. Maybe you're not going to feel stretched out 
quite as early, but it seems to me those are guys who should be able to carry a bigger workload this year. I mean, they, they, they effectively had two thirds of a year off last year. Uh, and you know, that ought to be, uh, you know, that, that ought to mean there's more miles left in the arm. On the other hand, you know, look, there is something to be said for the idea that, that why did guys used to be able to pitch so many more innings, right? And, and part of that is, okay, yes, there, there are reasons in the changes in the game. The pitchers are more muscular. They have to put in max effort on more of their pitches and all that. But part of it is just that guys got in the habit. You know, they got conditioned to throwing that much. Um, you know, somebody like Satchel Page. Uh, yeah, okay, Page didn't have to go all out when he was pitching a barnstorming exhibition against, like, you know, a bunch of farmers, which, you know, was part of what he did. But the man pitched, like, every day, all year round for, like, 40 years. And, and you know, that just that builds up the muscle. And, yeah, there are guys who are going to blow out if you try that with them. But some of those are the same guys who, if you baby them and you and you treat them, you know, as fragile objects, they're still going to blow their arms out. Yeah. Yeah. Some guys like Terry Wood, Brett Saberhagen, these are guys that were brilliant when they were healthy and among the best pitchers ever. But they just didn't have the, uh, the biology, the physiology to, to stay on the mound. I'm curious about your thoughts, too. Well, let me ask you this. The, the Mets seem to be a bit of a darling in the media. Maybe it's because of an East Coast bias, maybe it's something else, but your team gets a lot of play. Where do you go for honest assessment of where the team is? Because it's easy to, and, and you can get this, too. like every phenom is like going to change the world. And then they come up and you're like, eh, you know, not such a good assessment there. Cubs, Cubs and White Sox get this a lot too, where the uh, the expectations are outsized for what the reality is likely to be. So how do you how do you and maybe I'm unfair with that, but it doesn't happen much with the Marlins. Marlins are usually under you know, teams that have that. So do you agree that the Mets are one of those teams that kind of gets overhyped? And then um, I, I mean I think if, yeah. yeah if you're talking about prospects, I mean look certainly the Mets have gotten um, you know over the last oh twenty or thirty years. Uh, I think the Mets have gotten far more bad than good publicity. Uh, and I think the New York media and the national baseball media kind of love to trash the Mets. And for good reasons, nobody probably um, trashes the Mets more than Mets fans. Uh, I think there's that's that's obviously right now you're in a honeymoon period with new ownership. And people are really hoping that that's going to be different. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it is true that the big market, te- certain of the big market teams have had a tendency to have their prospects overhyped over the years and the Mets, the Mets have had more than their share of those. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I don't think that I need to worry about going to different media outlets to get an honest assessment of the major league players. I can do that myself and I can see that. I mean, frankly with the Mets, you know, you, I think you get a good honest assessment from, you know, even the broadcast teams and the radio teams, the, you know, they, they, I, I mean, I think that, that the Mets, you know, like the Mets, the Mets, uh, TV and radio teams, um, you know, they have some people there, first of all, who just don't care what you think of them, like Keith Hernandez, right? Keith Hernandez doesn't care. Um, but, you know, also, I think there's a sense that they understand that they have a bond with a fan base that doesn't trust the ownership. So they're not homers in that sense. Um, you know, in terms of getting an honest assessment of minor league prospects, I mean, I traditionally have gone to like, you know, baseball perspectives of fan graphs and some of those sites. I've been kind of a little turned off some of them more in, in recent years uh, as they've grown more political, uh, which is kind of a, you know, there's real, there's a, there's an interesting divide there because if you look at the older generation of baseball writers, um, there's some really vocal liberals there, you know, your Peter Gammons, your Mike Lupica, but a lot of the older baseball beat writers are kind of conservative guys. Whereas if you look at like the younger generation and by younger, I mean like under 50, um, in some cases, not far under 50, uh, like me, um, you know, there's an awful lot of like, that vi- they're just preponderantly very far left wing. Um, and, you know, I think that, that, that is kind of shape reshaping the coverage of the sport. And obviously that's, you know, I guess that probably, uh, leads us a bit into the all-star game controversy. Um, yeah, which I think is a terrible unforced error on Rob Manfred's part. This is, uh, and I like calling it an unforced error. You know, you've got a brand that is 
I wouldn't say baseball is struggling, but like anything else, the NFL is struggling. We're all, they're all trying to figure out how to grow and they've grown so much recently. You know, what do you do? And I, um, I follow baseball for the, the play on the field. Yes. But more importantly, like what guys like Andrew Friedman, what Brian Cashman does, you know, what these GMs do is they try to build these teams and, and sustain, like, I find that fascinating how they move the chess pieces. I think uh, Farhan Zaidi is great. Like the giants might, may not be like believing it yet, but he's so good at building a, a system from like the 60th player to the top player. And so that's what fascinates me. And I don't need a guy like Rob Manfred to put politics in it. I mean, baseball is the thing that, you know, on 9-11, baseball shut down for a couple of days and then they were back at it. You know, like they, they are just resolute. And I don't need, um, I don't need social justice in that. What's how do you how do we make a good does this make any sense is what's the positive spin for for Major League Baseball out of this is there something good I mean the 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 argument in favor is basically saying that well you know I mean I think there's a bait and switch element here right because the you know should baseball be completely hermetically separated from politics you know, every way, in every situation, always, forever. Of course you can't. That, that's, that's kind of a false choice, right? I mean, when baseball put Jackie Robinson on the field, um, that was in some sense a political, in a big sense, a political statement. But it was ultimately about the benefit of the game, you know, and it was about the game cleaning its own house. Um, and, you know, it changed the country. Uh, it really did. It was a my, one of the milestones of civil rights, much more than... Uh, than anything that happened in, in the NFL or the NBA. Um, you know, and yes, baseball has long promoted a kind of generic patriotism, right? The national anthem, which they started doing back in the, um, you know, during the First World War, um, you know, and, and even uh, post 9-11, it was, you know, there was obviously a political aspect to bringing the game back, to bringing out the president, Right. I mean, the presidents have often thrown out the first pitch on opening day in D.C., and, and it's been presidents of both parties. But I think there's a big difference between say between that and then saying, well, OK, because you let a little bit of, you know, general patriotism in the door because you took a stand against racial discrimination in your own business, that that means it's always a good idea to dive into every political controversy and do so as they did in Georgia in a way that is very openly partisan. Right. They are very much like saying, OK, everything the Democrats say about this bill that the Democrats don't like is right. And everything Republicans say is wrong. And, you know, we're just going to we're going to side all the way down the line uh, in a classic, um, you know, nuts and bolts of politics controversy with one party over the other. I think is it's it's a very bad idea. And I think. I mean, it is true. It is a dangerous time for the brand of Major League Baseball. I mean, it's frankly, if your business is not Amazon, it's a dangerous time for everybody's brand right now. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to find, find their way through a new landscape of technology, a new post-pandemic landscape. But I think that is truest in the entertainment industry, which sports is part of, because there's so much fierce competition right now for the entertainment dollar. Um, and, you know, football has had its own issues. Um, and, 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 you know, but in baseball's case, part of it is that, you know, kind of aging fan base that is the real installed, you know, traditional fan base. Uh, it is the competition with the NFL is something that's been an issue for baseball for, you know, 50 years now. Um, you know, and, and, and with the NBA for 40 years. Um, and so you have a lot of different things going on at the tempo of modern life. Um, that make it difficult for, you know, make it a struggle for baseball to retain fans. And then obviously you have missing two thirds of the season last year you have, but the things that are unforced to me are number one, the league tampering with the rules in ways that are really big departures from, uh, you know, from history. Uh, and the other is, is forcing themselves into a political controversy. They didn't really need to get involved in. Yeah, I can understand that, and I, I can appreciate that. The, <laughs> yeah, why would you force yourself into a political controversy? Because the thing about baseball is that it's always it's always had the ability to reach out internationally. It's not a black and white game. 
it's it's a game that has i don't know how many act i used to know all the times i was i thought we found this was fascinating but there's got to be 15 countries represented in baseball right now you know i mean i don't know if it's a canadian playing i don't know if there's an aussie playing but we could go on for quite a while naming the different places and players who, who come from a variety of places and I think that's what makes baseball great. Like remember the Dodgers UN uh, rotation where they had five different countries represented in their, in their rotation. You can, you can become great at baseball from anywhere. I mean, Venezuela is a hotbed. Curacao has produced near hall of fame players, all these different places. I, I think that's more of anything. Like anybody has a, you can grow up in, you know, <laughs> the Dominican Republic, not known for its uh, wealth and abundance. And you can, still come there and then make a difference back in your country it's, it's more of an american game when you look at the opportunity to come here to play with the best to make the most money and and do those things why even why even take this fight on and by the way it's about both you know and and there is a balanced scale that we have to have between uh access to votes and and you know legitimacy of the vote and tipping the scale one way or the other it's george's business but Dan, I don't get it. I don't understand why you even take this fight on. Yeah, and and it's and and look, I mean the the you know again the it, it if Georgia was you know doing things that looked like you know nineteen sixty five era Georgia sixty five I guess when Major League Baseball actually moved a franchise to Atlanta, um, you know if they were if they were still if it, then then you could see taking a stand, but. I mean, this is so marginal, so many of the things that are being done here. I mean, you know, the big protest is over the uh, the food and no food and drink to people who are, you know, you can't have people giving food and drink to people who are actually waiting online at the polling place. Well, that's actually, I mean, Georgia basically modeled that to a certain extent on a law that, that's already on the books in New York, where MLB has its headquarters. Uh, and that's not a brand new law in New York. It's been there for a while. And a great many states have have laws that say, like, you can't even approach people who are, who are online to vote. Um, and so, uh, you know, and you go down the list of things that were done in this Georgia bill. And it's a 98 page bill. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, detail to it. Um, but, you know, by and large, I mean, it takes a number of steps to expand access to vote. Uh, it, you know. Uh, and it tries to balance that with improving security and transparency. And you may not agree with necessarily every last call that's, that's made, whether you're a conservative or a liberal. But the idea that like every, you know, tiny marginal thing uh, in, in the voting procedures has to become a national, you know, test of morality is just insane. It's yeah. just it's it's completely it's, it's completely without perspective. <laughs> It, it does seem it does seem short sighted, and again, if Georgia wants to adjust its voter equity laws, I think that's appropriate. They just had this massive problem with trying to understand what happened. I, I don't think we'll ever have resolution. It's easy to say everything went to the courts and was subtle, but but if you look into it, that's just not true. And I'm not well to the political statement, but there's real problems with the voter integrity in in many states. So if we can we have the technology to significantly improve this or just go back in time and just hard count paper vote every single time. And, and by the way, if you, buy yeah, and that's, and that's part of what the part of, part of what the bill does. It creates, you know, more secure paper for the paper ballots and, and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I just, you know, people are like, well, why does Georgia have to do this? It's like, okay, did you miss the last couple of years? Like they just had a governor's election in 2018 where the loser refused to accept the legitimacy of the outcome from the democratic side and a presidential election in 2020 where the loser refused to accept the out the legitimacy of the outcome from the Republican side. Uh, and on top of that, you had, you know, things like the drop boxes and everything. You had all these emergency changes that were made in Georgia and across the country, but they were made in Georgia without even authorization in state law, right? The governor, the secretary of state and the governor, you know, that there were emergency measures taken. Uh, and so, you know, it, it totally makes sense for the Georgia legislature to sit down and say, you know what, it's time for us to improve public confidence. It's time for us to try to do some things that, you know, in a way that, that, that people trust and that makes sense and that maybe gives something to, to each side. And, and I mean, in terms of things like the drop boxes that takes an ex, a one year ex, emergency experiment and says, okay, 
here's what the rules are going to be going forward for that now in permanent state law. And, and let's just say this out loud, just in case anybody's, we're not saying that Donald Trump won the, the election. We're saying that Georgia needed to felt the need to clean house on voter integrity. And that is not going back to Jim Crow and it's not Jim Crow and steroids and all that, you know, pirate partisan nonsense. It's uh, we're well past that stage. Let's not go back to it. And there are how many things are there in Major League Baseball where you have to show some form of ID? I mean, if you go to pick up your tickets at a game at the will call desk for those that do that, you'd have to show some form of ID. You'd have to validate your um, your your purchase online, not your ticket online. I mean, you have to do these things. You have to show proof. And yeah, and and you know, baseball baseball teams. I mean, look, baseball teams. They're, will be the first to tell you that, um, you know, if you don't require ID, you can get scammed. I mean, think of how many controversies they've had with say Latin American ball players lying about their ages. Right. Right. And, 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 and when you think about it, why is it the Latin American players who lie about their ages and not other, other countries? The reason for that is simple. It's because they can, right. Cause this used to be a big problem with American born players too. But, you know, American birth certificate records are much easier to check now. So it doesn't happen with American players. But it's not because they don't have the motive. It's not because they're more honest. It's because right. we have better, you know, we have better paper trails here than, than they have in, say, the Dominican Republic or Cuba, obviously Cuba. Uh, sometimes it's just because the Cuban stuff is opaque because we don't have relation to Cuba. But, um, you know, so, I, I mean, I, I think of voting the same way, right, which is that people people still have a motive to misbehave. And so you have to have just sort of basic elementary security measures uh, so that people don't do the things that people, you know, people on all sides will otherwise do. Yeah. And, and we don't, I don't want to limit anybody's right to vote or access to the vote. And if we need to make exceptions to the, to the rules, then, then, okay, let's do those with, you know, an eye on always maintaining legitimacy. We have a we have an election legitimacy problem right now. If, if your side won, you don't think so. But when your side loses, you automatically. And I'm not saying this election. Just go back however many elections, and whoever side loses is like you said earlier, they're going to claim some kind of uh, chicanery. Why is baseball getting involved in any kind of election chicanery? They should be above that or adjacent to it, not even part of it. You want to work with Georgia to do some kind of thing to, to improve the condition of a people focus on that, but don't, don't why look, I already, Dan, I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy going to a baseball game. Like I used to anymore. I feel like I'm being fleeced every time they get a chance, $15 beers and all these other things. So I already, though I love baseball, I already barely consume any major league baseball. And because I live in LA and I don't have the right cable package, I can't even buy the MLB.com, you know, watch any game I want package because the Dodgers, they don't, they, I get to see about 10% of the games, right? So they have all these problems. This is a major market, LA, right? Where a lot of people who would love to watch and, and do these things, but I'm, I'm disincented from participating in the brand already. And now you bring politics in and I'm like, what are we focused on here? Are we focused on baseball or are we focused on uh, arbitrary things like voter rights in Georgia? Yeah, and I think it's it's there's there's also by the way an additional historical irony if you know baseball history uh, as to using the All Star Game as a vehicle for protest against like ballot security, right? Because if you know what happened in it was 1957, um, the Cincinnati Reds fans engaged in a massive, essentially ballot box stuffing campaign to. And they ended up electing, I think, eight Reds. To, and the Reds were like, a, they were like a fourth, fifth place team at the time, right? The, I think they, they elected, I think it was seven. I think they elected all but one starting position uh, were, were all the Reds. And, and baseball reacted by taking the vote away from the fans for like six years, right? They, they, they completely eliminated voting and, and said, we're, you know, we, did, we, we don't like this. This is too much you know, voter fraud for us, essentially, we're going to give the vote to the players and let them decide who's on the all-star team. And it was like, it was like six years before they, before they gave the vote back to the fans. Another funny thing, I was watching MLB Network the other day because I can't watch the Dodger game. I have to watch MLB Network to get updates. And it was Harold Reynolds, God bless Harold Reynolds. But they were trying to, they had these guys, it was obviously a segment they had to talk about. It was really uncomfortable because you could see these guys were like, oh, 
didn't have a whole lot to say. Didn't and it, these are sports guys; they don't have anything terribly insightful to say. But Harold said, "You know, why would Georgia want to limit what the people can say? Look how the All Star Game is done. That's voted by the people, and it's like, yeah." <laughs> and they openly stuff the box, right? Like, they can yeah. ballot if you want, vote for the vote for the A or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, even today. I mean, even today, the the, the All Star balloting is just notoriously rife with with voter fraud in a sense in the to vote early and often it's encouraged the yeah, league it's wants you to cast as many yeah. ballots as you can but not in an election not in an actual election yeah. we want actual people to do actual good things uh i guess let's uh, i wanted to stay on baseball for another minute here uh theo epstein is is sort of like the the minister of fun and getting people to come out to the ball game you know and obviously they need to work on these things because i think Look, you've got uh, all these shortstops that are going to come out. Story, I mean, Seager. I guess Lindor just signed, you know, with the uh, with the Mets. That's awesome for you guys. But there's only so many three hundred plus million dollar contracts that can be doled out with any kind of a sane approach to this. And we've already got probably close to the limit on that. You know, it's not saying that these next guys don't deserve it, but at some point, you know, baseball does it itself. I mean, like Bobby Bonilla day is coming up, right? Like these contracts oftentimes come back you know, to haunt teams. And so, you know, like the Dodgers probably have three guys that are going to need deep into the uh, into the hundreds of millions to sign them. So how how does baseball proceed with that? Because the big multi billion dollar network TV contracts that day is gone. They're not going to spend that money for that anymore because they can't sell the ads. I mean, there's less and less people watching ads. So when you look at the marketplace, and getting people to the game, and also, <laughs> you know, at some point we need to have a real you know, agreement between the players and the uh, and the owners because there's a lot of money being filtered into baseball that the players aren't necessarily getting enough of a taste of. At least I would think they, they would say that. Yeah, well, I mean, the players always say that. You know, yeah. they're, they're yeah. yeah, and and the owners all say always say that they're they're losing money, right? No, <laughs> no, no baseball owner has ever admitted to making a dime off his team, right? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, look, they're. I mean, I think like the Lindor contract makes a ton of sense if you assume that the business of baseball will continue to be healthy. Um, now, it could be a di- even then it could be a disaster, right? I mean, no ball player is ever a sure thing to stay healthy, to stay at the top of his game, um, to stay motivated. I mean, these guys, you know, uh, I think the the true championship caliber athletes generally do not suddenly become unmotivated, but. You know, some some guys respond better than others to that situation. Um, so you never know. I mean, I think Lindor, the Lindor deal makes sense. And it makes sense from a franchise credibility point, right, that the Mets in particular felt they needed to lay out big money. And not just big money, but big money to a guy who's obviously like an, you know, in his prime worth it guy and not just like spending a bunch of money on yet another like 33-year-old left fielder. Um, but... Uh, uh, you know, but it, it is true. I mean, the, the, it, if a whole bunch of teams lock themselves into big deals like this, and then the business takes a multi-year downturn, then you've got a real problem. Uh, cause no matter what your profit margins are, uh, you know, when you fix yourself into big long-term contracts and you start making a lot less money than you expected and projected to make, you're gonna, you're gonna have some pain. Um, you know, and you're going to have some shakeouts and, and things. So, uh, but look, uh, if people want to spend, you know, if they want to increase the number of 200 and 300 million dollar deals that are going to, you know, shortstops in their 20s who are legitimate superstar ceiling guys uh, and reasonably proven commodities at the major league level, I don't think that's all that unra- uh, irrational at all. Until Trevor Story snaps his humorous or something, you know, and and is never the same player again. And oh my God, you know, uh, um, there's just history is rife with so many of these contracts that uh, they just right. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, look at look at Troy Tulowitzki. I mean, just as an example for Story, right? I mean, Tulowitzki was yeah. was absolutely the kind of guy you would give that kind of money to, and yet, you know, he I mean, he broke down pretty badly physically in his you know in his early to mid thirties. Right. Right. Or uh, Jose Reyes. I mean, the Mets got away from that contract, luckily. But, you know, that's uh, that's another guy that seemed like he was going to be a fantastic player and then just almost instantly washed out. And and it is musical chairs, right? Like, is Manny Machado worth it? 
I don't know. We'll see. You know, he's kind of erratic, and there's a lot of players that are making a lot of money. Is Bryce Harper worth it? Maybe. You know, if you don't win, is it worth it? And then these other guys that are coming down the pipe at the end of this year and next year, there's, I don't know, what, seven $250 million contracts or more sitting right there waiting. And then how many? Teams? Well, I think with the Padres, there's 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 also the kind of good money after bad thing of like, do you need to spend big money on, you know, Tatis in order to justify the money you already gave to Machado and Hosmer, right? Because the last thing you want to do is um, is spend all this money to try to build a com- contending team and then decide that you're out of money and let your, you know, let one of your superstars walk. And then you've, you, then you really have wasted the money you spent. I mean, right. Like the Rangers, when they spent all that money on a rod and, and Chan Ho park. Right. And people blamed a rod cause he was the a list contract there. Right. But right. the real problem was that they spent all this money on park who washed out and then they were, you know, they had wasted that and they'd spent all their money on A-Rod and then they didn't spend money to surround A-Rod with winners. And then it was like, okay, what did you give him $250 million for? Right? Like, you know, you, you go big or go home, you spend 250 million on your cornerstone player. You have to invest in building around it. I, I want to curious about your thoughts. So when you talk about teams and, and one of the things that we try to understand about baseball is like, uh, we think that the big money team, like the Yankees and the Dodgers just buy the best available player, but they don't. And, and they haven't for a long time. I mean, Brian Cashman has done some of that, but also because championships are the standard for the Yankees. But you look at the Dodgers, they may let their best players go because they've got excellent players behind them and they develop the heck out of players, or they, they take those developed players and rotate them for something else like a year of you Darvish or whatever it's going to be. So if you, um, when you look at the Mets, are the Mets competent enough at developing talent, do you think, to continue to let, like when Pete Alonso comes up for free agency, and we're a few years off from that still, but do they just let him walk because they know they can develop as somebody else? Or are, are most of the guys Duda as opposed to Alonso and they have to buy this talent? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, again, I think it's premature to, to ask that about the Mets because you have a new ownership team. And so you know, past results may not guarantee future performance. Um, but it, I mean, you know, their system has produced a number of good players over the last couple of years. So they've got, it, it, at least at the farm system level, they've got a pretty decent start to right. work from. Um, you know, and you had some guys you could trade as trade chips. I mean, Andres Jimenez clearly was one of the keys to why they were able to make the Lindor deal, right? And they right. they were able to go to the, the Indians and say, look, we'll give you Rosario and Jimenez. Um, and that's, you know, that's a chip you can cash in. Um, I mean, in Alonzo's case, I guess they, that there's also, uh, uh, you know, I mean, they, 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 you've also produced some other guys, uh, you know, at that position. So, um, but I don't, I don't know that they have anybody else in the pipeline yet, but, uh, behind him. Yeah. And then. One of the other questions I'm always thinking about is we talk about small market teams. It turns out Oakland is not in a small market. Oakland is in a massive market. San Diego is not a small market. It is a massive market. And so what do you think, what are the true small market teams where they have to struggle to compete with, with the bigger teams that, because the Dodgers spend a lot of money, but they spend it on training and they spend it on development and they spend it on, you know, I, IDing players, you know, internationally. They spend a lot of money that you don't see on the field for several years and and they're able to buy lottery tickets. So their money has power, but who are the teams that truly can't compete? Because the A's, if they chose to have access to billions of dollars in revenue, if they're able to put butts in the seats and, you know, activate media contracts and whatnot. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things that go into it. I mean, right. The A's, I mean, notoriously the A's problem um, has been, uh, you know, the fact that the, the, the giants would never let them, move to build a new ballpark uh right because the idea is that you're if you move to like san jose you're moving into the giants territory never mind that they're already in the giants territory but the giants re- you know the way that rule is written the territory rule is written you could stay where you are but even if you move further away that's in their territory and they can block it um you know and i think the the a's problem has never really been the tv market so much although they do have to compete with the giants in the tv market but the pe- you know people didn't love driving into oakland uh obviously to go to games um i mean 
you know, it, the size of a market obviously depends in part on who the, who the competition is, right? How many other teams are in the market? And also, if you have an installed base of baseball fans, I think the Marlins uh, have had trouble building. Um, I mean, the Marlins have a particular problem because they keep their fans have kind of PTSD from all the times they've burned down the roster. Um, yeah. You know, clearly like the Royals and the Pirates have had pretty small markets, but I, I don't know why the Pirates necessarily have to have a tiny market. Pittsburgh isn't that small a city. It's got a great baseball tradition. There's, but it is also the part, part of the problem that the Pirates have too is that is that they don't have a ton of Western territory, right? Because you go much west of there and you've got Indians fans and Reds fans. So, you know, they don't have like what the Cardinals have, the kind of regional market. Uh, and the fact that the Cardinals have such an installed regional market uh, and had it for such a long time is part of the reason why the Royals don't have a large market, right? Because because a lot of the area that, that could have been potential Royals territory is already Cardinals fans. Yeah. Well, and the Cardinals and Cubs and Braves also did a great job of mastering media early, you know, for, for the different uh, times that they were there. So, you know, TBS just put the Braves on everybody's map, and then the Braves got good. I mean, you remember back when the Cubs and the Braves were terrible, but you could watch oh, yeah. them all the time, you know. <laughs> and then the radio days for St. Louis and for, for the Cubs, you know, you could hear a Cubs game in Iowa and Nebraska, and so those that's Cubs territory or Cardinals territory. And so then the Royals come in years and years later and it's like well we're already we already have our our bodies assigned for the next couple of generations thank you so much for showing up Royals. great ballpark you know but just not quite enough people yeah i mean you know i mean go back to the 30s and uh, ronald reagan was broadcasting cubs games into the iowa market so yeah 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 yeah, it's interesting. All right, I want to ask a little bit about the Biden presidency and some of the things you see, like we, you know, you and I were talking off mic. We have to move on. Donald Trump, it turns out, I don't know if you know this or not, he's not the president anymore. We have a new guy in office. And we would talk about, we always forget this. We talked about choosing the lesser of two evils, which means you're picking evil. So we have a guy that still wasn't anybody's top choice. I mean, he was, Joe Biden was a joke in his own party. Kamala Harris, was, candidacy was destroyed by one question from Tulsi Gabbard. She earned as many delegates as you and I. So these aren't people that are loved for their credentials. They're loved for their party, maybe. But what do we do now that, that we have a president that is, you know, as problematic? Because Joe Biden just isn't a great candidate ever. And now he's the boss. Yeah. And he's, you know, I mean, look, he's 78 years old. He's nothing Joe Biden is or does is going to get any better from here. Right. Uh, this is as good as it gets. Um, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, I mean, obviously from, from my perspective, it's very unfortunate, um, that Republicans lost control of the Senate at the end, uh, of the election season. And so, you know, Biden does have the power to ram through a lot of things, but, but he's got to get all 50 senators, all 50 Democrats on his side. And that's, you see, he has a very small margin for error and a surprisingly small margin in the house. Uh, that hasn't been an issue yet, but undoubtedly there there are some things that, um, you know, there are going to be some constraints even on what the Democrats can do in the House uh, when you've only got like an eight or nine seat majority. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, Joe Manchin, Joe Manchin right now, uh, and not only Manchin, uh, Kristen Cinema as well, uh, can kind of dictate terms to the Democrats. I mean, the... The fact that they can't get anything through the filibuster is precisely why we're seeing so much attention on spending money, right? Because that's the one thing that you can do with 50 votes. Uh, well, the two things you could do with 50 votes in the Senate, right, is taxes and spending. Um, and the, the sheer amount of spending that they're looking at doing is just staggering. And it really is, a lot of it is aimed at, um, you know, payoffs to their constituencies, ways to fund their own advocacy organizations. Um, you know, I mean, that's the, even their big voting bill, uh, which obviously isn't getting anywhere in the Senate. You know, it has all these provisions about, you know, it, it basically wants the federal government to take over the job of registering college students, which is previously a major expenditure for the Democratic Party. Um, so a lot of what they're trying to do is to, is to essentially uh, funnel taxpayer money to benefit themselves. Um, you know, and to benefit, 
to, you know, the teachers unions and state and local governments and blue states and all that sort of thing. Um, but the, the amount of spending that they're proposing is just staggering. I mean, it's just, you know, and, 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 and people say, well, yeah, but didn't, didn't, uh, George W. Bush spend a lot of money. Didn't Donald Trump spend a lot of money. Didn't Reagan spend a lot of money. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the choice is always between uh, irresponsible Republicans and catastrophically irresponsible Democrats. But I think that there's two things that people miss about that, right? One of which is that with a few occasional exceptions, like, like Bush pushing the Medicare Part D, you know, when Republicans spend money, they tend to go out and be like, okay, let's spend some money this year. Whereas the Democrats are like, let's put in a, let's put in a new program that will spend this amount of money every year until like, you know, the sun freezes and the earth is a frozen ball of ice. Um, and the other thing is that the, um, the, the sheer quantity of what Biden is trying to spend here is far and away beyond anything we've ever seen in American history. I mean, 1.9 trillion uh, for his, his COVID relief bill, much of which has nothing to do with COVID relief and, and a good deal of which isn't even supposed to be spent this year. Um, and then you add on to that another 2.3 trillion uh, that he's trying to spend in this infrastructure package. Um, and then, you know, there's talk that there may be another $2 trillion, uh, like education and, and other social program spending bill on the way. Um, you know, once you're talking about like $6 trillion, I mean, that's, that's like, what, $40,000, $50,000 for every household in the country. Where, where are you going to get that money? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and this is like I'm no fan of the Republicans. I, I I have a place in my heart for everybody, but you know, what are the Republicans going to do about this? I mean, if you if the spending horse leaves the barn, and we don't know when this will happen, when like there's there's just too much money, you know, being spent, and and there's going to be a devaluation of the dollar, hyperinflation, whatever it's going to be, there's going to be a cost for this money. Um, what are the Republicans doing about it? I mean, they put together candidates that. You know, weren't terribly exciting for the presidency. Then we had Donald Trump, and and who's going to be next? Another Donald Trump presidency? Please, let's lose something else. Let's get somebody in there who, who can help with this. And and the Democrats are just as guilty. Their guys, Joe Biden. You know, this is the party that had uh, an Asian dude running, and and Tulsi Gabbard, who's a veteran and has you know people of color background, and they pick the old black guy. But only after the other old white guy who brought $100 million into the election was kicked out, you know, didn't garner enough vote. So we're not keeping our Right. I mean, it was it was sort of amazing when they got to the point where Biden was out there and he's 77 and he was the third oldest guy on the stage next to uh, Sanders and Bloomberg. Bloomberg's actually older than Biden is. Uh, he may not look it, but he is. I can't take um, this party seriously, either of them. And this is what we got to choose from. And all of this incredible people in this nation who could probably do a pretty solid job, even if they just held the rudder down the middle. Um, why do we get such crap people? I mean, these these aren't. This is not our best and brightest. No matter who's on the stage in any of these debates. Yeah, I mean, one of my one of my longstanding things is I, you know, I I I, I, I always feel like we ought to have people who are experienced and accomplished and particularly as, you know, governors. Um, I think that's a better way to go. Uh, and it wasn't so long ago that, you know, you'd see Reagan and, and, you know, George W. Bush and even Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, that the parties would go to governors, right? You'd get somebody who who'd sort of made their bones outside of the beltway, um, who had proven that they could run something. Um, and hopefully we'll see that, you know, see that at least given us a, a serious fair hearing this time around. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, the governors got massacred in the Democratic primary this time around. And and obviously most of them got squashed in the Trump race. too. I mean, the people who were left standing against Trump, um, I mean, yeah, Kasich sort of simply by staying in the race got some votes. But I mean, he was he was finishing like eighth and ninth early on. Um, and then all of the other governors got sort of run off the road. So the only people who were left really with Trump even were, were, you know, relatively young senators. Um, so I do think that, that the parties need to give more thought again to having, have bringing in presidential candidates who have actually run something in the past. What about outsiders? I mean, can either party legitimately run an outsider right now, or are we over outsiders for a while? Um, 
I mean, I think, uh, well, I mean, the Democrats obviously are just going to run, you know, four years from now, they're going to run Biden or Harris, uh, presumably, um, you know, and, and so I don't think they're going to have a whole lot of openings for that. Um, on the Republican side, I, I don't know that I can see another outsider candidate who is not Trump and who is not like, say, one of Trump's kids. And at those at this point, they're not outsiders anymore. Right. I mean, you, you can't get more insider than being a former president of the United States. Um, but uh, I, I don't think you're going to see a different outsider. I mean, there are some people who think, well, maybe Tucker Carlson might run. Right. Because he's a media guy. Although, you know, he's again one of these. You know, it's sort of like when Pat Buchanan ran, like, you know, oh, yeah, you're going to run a guy as I mean, Buchanan was the ultimate sort of on the one hand outsider. On the other hand, a guy who was literally born in D.C. and worked in the White House and everything. Right. I mean, Tucker has been such a part of the, uh, you know, the political media establishment for so long. Um, it's hard to really think of him as a genuine outsider. Um, but, it, yeah, I, I, I don't think we're going to see another true outsider for a while i think i think uh you know the republicans are probably going to end up going back towards a a somewhat more conventional candidate next time unless it's trump again um so you know we'll see trump isn't worth the squeeze like the juice that you get whatever good he does like he ran on term limits people talk about term limits all the time like well trump run on that like yeah i can't do you know like it's just he creates too much he purposely talk about unforced errors dan there's the king of unforced errors where oh yeah he just purposely smashes his own success all the time but i think you know i think even if you're going to make kind of the devil's advocate case for trump and i'm 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 certainly somebody who has a very long record as a trump critic um i think the devil's advocate case for trump though is that sometimes you need to bring somebody in who breaks things shakes things up and prepares the way right for somebody you know so you need the revolutionary personality and then after that's happened then you need somebody to come in and fix it actually fix it not just undo not just break a bunch of things that were wrong but create new things that work so even even if you take that position right even if you take that that position that is sympathetic to trump that says look we needed that guy to come in here and shake up the way people thought about things and shake up the way people talked about things. And, you know, we needed a chaos agent, right? Okay. If you buy the argument that we needed a chaos agent, we don't need to bring him back for more chaos. We don't need to bring in a different guy for more additional and different chaos, right? At that point, then you need to be able to go back and say, let's get somebody who actually can build something. Is it possible for any presidential candidate who wins to actually have a mandate right now they, they all claim it but they never have it george bush the elder or senior didn't have it george bush the younger didn't have it you know bill clinton didn't have it who's who can have a mandate anymore? is that even not a thing like if you talk about uniting nothing that joe biden is doing is uniting people he's just you know continuing to do and then the, the person on the right who comes in next will do the same thing and the, the party system is really struggling to find mandates. It is harder. It is. It has gotten harder. Um, I think it depends. I think part of it, too, is that, um, you know, you have to read your mandate correctly. OK. Um, you know, I think Trump had a mandate to do some things. Um, uh, you know, I think he could legitimately claim that he had a mandate to do tougher immigration, uh, to rethink trade. Um you know, and up to a point, he did some of those things. You know, Obama, for example, I mean, Obama had 60 senators, right, coming in after a financial crisis. I think Obama actually had a pretty strong mandate to come in and do financial services stuff, right, to fix Wall Street. And he did some of that, and he did it badly. Um, but, but I mean, with Dodd-Frank, he did it in a way that was sort of conventional and um, just piled more regulatory you know, glop on top, on top of the existing structure. Um, I actually think he might've had a mandate to do some more sweeping populisty things there, but he decided instead he wanted to low key that and spend his political capital on healthcare, which was yeah. not really the big driver. Yeah. I mean, it was certainly part of, uh, it was not really the big driver, I think of, of that election. Um, you know, I think George W. Bush actually had a pretty good mandate in some ways because uh, on domestic policy, 
I mean, his foreign policy was very much a mandate that he had because of events that happened after he was in office. Sure. Um, but I think Bush came in with a certain mandate because he had governed in Texas in a particular way. He had done certain things in Texas and he ran for president on the grounds that I'm going to do the same things in the White House that I did in Texas. And he essentially did those things, right? I mean, his domestic policy tax cuts, you know, this kind of top down education reform, um, you know, even the Medicare Part D, those were the things he ran on. And so he was able to get some of those things done through Congress, maybe not exactly the way he wanted them. But, but you know, in his first couple of years in office, he was able to get things done because he ran on stuff he'd already done and, re and run on doing them again. So I think you have a window as a new president to do some of that. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly Biden was able to squeeze out some of that just based on, you know, on COVID relief, even though he, he snuck a lot of things in there. Yeah. But Biden's problem, I think, is that an awful lot of his mandate, um, you know, it's two things, right? Which is uh, get us out of the pandemic and don't be Trump. Right. Because a lot of people were just sick of Trump. Yeah. Um, they wanted Trump to go. They just make make the man go away. Make him go away. Make him stop. Make him shut up. Make him leave. And Biden already done that. Right. All he has to do is like not be Trump. Uh, and that's the easy part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and given his um, questionable, I'll say, mental state, it's probably good that he kind of just holds up and lets things kind of just, you know, go at, at a different pace than uh, what Donald Trump is doing. Donald Trump's reelection campaign platform, though, was pretty strong. I mean, he had some some, you know, he came in and and I don't want to say he fulfilled more promises than promises than any recent president, but. You had to, you had to at least on the surface go. You know, he may actually do something about term limits. He may actually, you know, get us out of these foreign entanglements. You know, he may actually continue to support local business and, and make things happen. It's just he's so he's so unpalatable. He's so odious. It's, you know, I'm sure the people that held their nose and voted for him, you know, were like, I, I'm voting for the, you know, the hopeful good things. And now that's all gone. And now we have to see what uh, what Joe Biden's capable of doing and. Look, just on his record, I don't know that he can. I want to give the guy a chance. I want him to succeed, but I, I don't know that he's capable of of getting things right because he's look. I mean, there has not been a good foreign policy president probably since George Bush the Elder, but nobody, nobody among the four people that ran for president, vice president, were any good at foreign policy. Uh, you know, we domestic policy were a mess because we can't. Everybody wants all the people that want us to be a socialist country. We don't get along good enough to be a socialist country. <laughs> we, the kind, we can't agree on the kind of democracy or republic we are. I mean, you can say, fine, but now we're a socialist country. Not going to get along. Not going to go in the same direction. So I don't know, man. It's it's a mess. I, I don't know if um, are we, you know, we look at these sort of middle of the road uh, in terms of performance presidents going from, let's say, uh, Bill Clinton on through to Donald Trump. You know, it's hard to get your rating above 50 percent uh, any time later in your term because we just don't do that. I mean, people don't want to hear it, but, but Barack Obama and Donald Trump have similar approval ratings. I mean, it's just it's just true. So are we looking at just continuing to tear ourselves apart where we break into many states, like, you know, many little micro nations? Are, are we are we um, past a point of no return? Is this all just like, nah, you know, we'll be all right. We continue to do the big things well, and, and we're going to continue to do them well. Or I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts about the future? Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly you can look back at American history and say, well, you know, we have been through worse than this um, and, and more divisive than this. We actually went through uh, we actually happened. <laughs> right. I mean, well, we, I mean, you know, we had literally a civil war. I mean, we, you know, uh, you look at, yeah, even the 1930s, the 1790s, like there were a lot of very rough periods in American history. Um, and, and, you know, if you looked at any given time in his history, um, you know, there were always trends that you if you looked at them at the time and you said, well, if things keep going in this direction, like but things never keep going in the same direction. Right. Something always changes, um, you know, and then. Boy, what's the line about, you know, if something can't go on forever, it will stop. Um, now, you know, it, the things that worry me the most are the things that seem to have been going in the same direction for a long time without stop. Right. I mean, that the government keeps growing forever. Um, you know, that that we have 
for example, a declining and aging population? Um, you know, do we have skyrocketing debt that we have? Uh, you know, the, if you if you look at the cost of health care, it just only goes up. If you look at the cost of education, it only goes up. If you look at the left wing trends in education uh, and entertainment and journalism, they just keep going in one direction forever. Um, and so that is, yeah, that is something that worries me is, is those things that look like trends that will last forever. Um, but sooner or later they won't, right? And, and, and we've seen too many times in history the way things break uh, and change uh, away from where they were. I mean, yeah, if you were, um, you know, if you were like, you know, a black American in 1930, right? You would have looked at, at well, where, have, where, where has everything gone since like 1876, right? It's all gone in one direction and none of it's been good. Um, and, you know, you might have predicted that that's going to go on forever. And it didn't. Uh, eventually it turned. And so, and, and you could look at a lot of different things in American history from foreign policy to, you know, uh, to our economy to, you know, things looked like they were going in one direction forever and then they stopped and turned around. Um, so, you know, I think I'm, I'm not necessarily ready to despair that we are digging ourselves into permanent trenches that will never move. Um, but there's no question that the, just looking at the electric electorate and the culture that there seems to be less given the joints than there has been in the past. Um, less immediate change. On the other hand, Hey, you know, if anybody had told you in like the spring of 2016, right, that in the fall of 2020, that Donald Trump would be running for re-election, that turnout would be at a record high, and that Trump would have the best performance among non-white voters in like, you know, decades for a Republican, they would have looked at you like you're absolutely crazy. Now, does that mean that Trump, you know, first of all, you would have thought that Trump would have won in that situation, and he didn't. Um, and you know, you would certainly not look at those results and say, well, gee, everything went hunky dory for Republicans in a lot of ways, uh, even with non-white voters. But the point is that when you see a shift like that, uh, and you saw some fairly dramatic shifts in some areas, uh, and those shifts aren't necessarily permanent trends either, but they are a reminder that things eventually can and do change, uh, beyond what you would predict. Would you say that uh, so Donald Trump? Yeah, again, he goes to the election and he gets more more votes than any um, you know sitting president ever. Did did Joe Biden's team just do a better job of of uh, playing all of the cards that are in the? De- I'm trying to be very careful. I say this. Look, I don't know that either side didn't cheat. You know, I, I think they both probably did at some level. And I, I've always said, like, as a, as a spy, like, you give me a small budget, I can go out and flip. You tell me which districts you want to flip, and you give me a couple million dollars, I can probably get that done because there's people out there that will do a lot of things for, for a small amount of money. It's just not that it's not that complicated to do. But um, I don't know. Do we have a voter fraud problem, do you think? I mean, I think the question is, do we have a problem or do we have a huge problem? Right. And I think obviously the answer is that we have vulnerabilities in the system. And every year some people exploit those uh, and a certain number of those people get arrested uh, and charged. And simple common sense tells you that for every person who gets arrested and charged, there are probably at least a couple out there. You know, I mean, are we catching 100 percent of voter fraud? I think that's highly unlikely. Uh, we're probably catching less than 50%. We might be catching less than 30 or 20%. I don't know. Um, but on the other hand, are we catching like 1%? No, we're probably catching more than that, I would think. Uh, so I don't think that there's, you know, when you see in any given election cycle, you know, a couple of dozen, you know, a dozen people or a couple of dozen people get arrested for voter fraud. I don't think that means that we have like 10 million fraudulent votes out. But I think it's enough that, you know, it certainly can be a real risk of swinging a close election. Um, I mean, we just had an election in Iowa for a House seat. You know, the House is divided by like nine seats as it is, eight seats. And we just had one of them decided by six votes. Now, you tell me, is it possible, given the volume of voter fraud that we know about that gets caught every year, 
can you have a, a, you know as many as six fraudulent votes in a house district oh hell hell yes hell yes and so you know that that does not mean that we should be like totally overhauling our electoral system but it means that yeah we should be we should remember that this is still something that can be a real threat to the integrity of our elections and and you know we should take modest steps which is what i think you know for the most part most of the republican proposals have done which is to take relatively moderate modest steps to you know um and, and some of those steps deter fraud you know it's not just that they catch fraud they deter it that when people see that you're being asked for ID, that you're keeping a paper trail of votes and things like that, it it deters shenanigans, not just voter fraud, but also other kinds of electoral fraud. You know, in the counting of votes and the, uh, you know, in the mailing and in the registration, and there's all different points to the system. So, I mean, I think this is something that we know has been a huge problem at times in America's history, right? In the past, we we know that. Uh, we know that there's still uh, a motive to do it if anything, a greater motive now because of how intense people are about politics. Um, and so I think you take common sense steps to deal with that. You got time for one more question? Yeah, sure. The, I don't know if you know Matt Brainerd's work. And uh, one of the problems with Matt Brainerd is he's you know very right-leaning and open about it. He'll, he'll do his uh, YouTube video with a Trump sign behind him. But he went through and did some cross-state. He did several different voter checks, right? And I'm not making commentary on his work. I'm curious what you think of it, but he said, okay, let's call people who voted and, um, um, you know, their vote wasn't tabulated. Did they know that? And then there are people like, no, I thought it was. And then there was the opposite where, did you realize you voted in the election? No, I didn't. And then they also cross-checked voter rolls between states and found a lot of uh, what appears to be double voting for people who are, say, residents in California who voted in Nevada or Arizona. And again, these are all states that were, you know, severe swing states. So what are your thoughts on his work? Are you familiar enough with it to even comment? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into sort of detail of his specific stuff, but, but I've certainly seen some of the studies that have been done on the... Uh, um, you know that that have found certainly that 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 uh, you know examples of of people who are you know lots of people who are registered in multiple jurisdictions uh, and certainly have the you know yeah. that there's there's not really an adequate safeguard to prevent them from being voted in multiple jurisdictions. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that concerns me is the timetables here, right? What's yeah. what's one of the simplest methods to keep people from voting in two states? Well, if everybody's got to vote on the same day. You can't go too many places in one day, right? If you've got a month to vote, you can go a lot more places. And I mean, the way the way the Democrats want to set things up is that you can start voting a month before Election Day and you can still change your registration on Election Day or register in a new place. Um, you can walk into a voting booth, uh, walk into a polling place and say, yeah, I'm registered to vote, except um I want to make sure that you guys change my name and address there and I'll vote under that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's not, that's not, you know, that's not good security. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think it, compressing the time has a, has a certain, you know, time and space still matter in these things. If you, if you have a reasonably compressed time and space in which to cast your ballot, uh, you know, that there's still adequate time for, for anyone to vote once. But maybe puts a uh, you know a greater burden on people who are trying to vote more than once. I don't care what party you're from. If you make a system that's more permissive, more people are going to exploit that permissibility. I mean, that's just what's going to happen, especially when the stakes are as high as they are. And so we you know we've got to figure it out. In California, you cannot buy ammo unless you have an upgraded driver's license. Like you have to have the real we call it the real ID. It's the one that will allow you to fly. It's like not a passport, but it's more than just a regular California license. That's just to buy bullets. Bullets yeah. aren't all at all, you know. Uh, and we also have very permissive, uh, you know, absentee balloting, which again I'm fine with. But let's confirm that you're not voting in more than one place. And and at some point, if we continue to create opportunities for exploitation, then everybody's going to exploit the integrity of our elections. And then the UN's going to be here validating our elections as opposed to us being with the UN somewhere else validating somebody else's. And it, it's not going to be pretty, you know. Yeah, and don't don't ask how the UN got elected. <laughs> right, but yeah, I mean, uh, and 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 look, I mean, um, in in 
you know, if you look 10 years ago, right, Republicans were pushing for, and, and there's always hypocrisy on both sides of this, but, you know, Republicans were pushing for voter ID, um, for in-person voting. And one of the big refrains from, you know, liberal and progressive pundits and from Democrats was, well, you guys are, you guys don't really care about the integrity of the vote, right? And how do we know that? Because you're not trying to do this with absentee ballots. And hey, absentee ballots are the real sorts of voting fraud in this country. Like the New York Times ran a big splashy story on this in like 2012, right? Absentee ballots aren't secure and they're, 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 you know, and all of that. And then, and then now all of a sudden when there's this big surge of Democrats voting absentee, all of a sudden, uh, you know, well, yes, Republicans got suddenly got interested in the security of the absentee ballot, but also Democrats suddenly discovered uh, that they didn't actually think it was a big problem. Um, and so it's just it's 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 you know it's it's completely hypocritical. Um, and, to have the government pay you a hundred dollars if you vote, and you get paid to your social security card, and then we just deal with it that way. How about that? Well, I'm not a big fan of uh, spending even more money to get people to do what they ought to do in the first place. Um, right. You know, a as it is, if you don't vote, you stand a pretty good chance of it getting taken out of your hide uh, by the government anyway. So. Uh, you know, yeah, I hear you. All right, well, listen, let me, let me run this thing. Hey, thanks for coming down and hanging out with me. Hold on one second. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. 